Good afternoon, everybody. It's Jeff Goldberg for the Sales Pro Network here on Facebook. It's Friday. We're a little later than usual, but there were various reasons. Uh, I'm broadcasting coming to you from the East Coast of the United States, and we're have a terrific guest today. As you know, the Sales Pro Network was founded to elevate the profession of sales. It's a place where you can come and uh, share insights. You can share complaints and problems and challenges, get coaching from terrific uh, coaches and trainers, not just myself, but a lot of others. And every Friday, we do a Facebook Live with incredible guests. And I've been really looking forward to this one. And I hope you have too, because the topic for today is one that plagues every sales organization that I've ever walked into and every salesperson I've ever spoken to. It's truly my pleasure to introduce you to Jason Bay. Jason, how are you today? What's up, man? Yeah, it, it was rescheduled because of me. I, I, I'm the a-hole here. So uh, <laughs> no, I appreciate you being flexible, man. Yeah, Jason's not a whole what he is, is very popular, very busy, <laughs> very successful, and that's why we had it rescheduled. But hey, look, maybe maybe afternoons are better for everybody. We'll find out. So um, uh, Jason, who likes to be called J-Bay, but being that I'm an old guy, I, I, I think I'm going to have to stick with Jason. Your J choice, feels, dude. J-Bay feels like an old guy trying to, 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 to look young in, in my book. Uh, could you just tell everybody a little bit about how you got to where you are, what formed you, caused you to get into the, the prospecting arena, and how you formed your company? Yeah. I mean, the way that I got into sales was by doing a lot of cold prospecting actually um, for B2C stuff. So my first sales job was what, uh, 2008 uh, as a freshman in college, I went door to door selling house painting services. So that was, uh, it was a lot of fun. It was really kind of hard at first, but I did really well at it. I sold like a hundred thousand dollars for the paint jobs and you know, four or five months made like 27 grand for school. Like I was like, I love sales. <laughs> you know what I mean? Um, and I, I learned sort of at that point that I wanted to be in sales because I was studying forensic science. So I thought I wanted to be a forensic scientist. Um, so this is like a 180, right? So I learned that I wanted to be in sales. And then the other thing I learned too was that I kind of had a knack for creating my own systems and frameworks and uh, teaching other people how to do stuff too. So I didn't really use a lot of the scripts that I was given. I kind of built a lot of my own processes around things, kind of using that as a foundation and then just, you know, reading books like Little Red Book of Selling by Jeffrey Gitterman. That was the first sales book I read. Um, so I was a sales manager with them the rest of college. And that's how I really figured out that, hey, I, I love teaching and coaching and training. Um, so I worked with that company for like seven years. Um, so I was a sales manager. And then when I graduated, I actually became their marketing director for three years. And that was where I got a lot of exposure to outbound, primarily over the phone. So I started an outbound call center. And we started with five reps. I was making a lot of calls actually too. And um, it was like, hey, we have 10,000 customers that hire our company every year, but hundreds of thousands sign up and they never get an estimate from us. We're gonna call them, we're gonna cold call people, we're gonna do all kinds of stuff. So I would have <laughs> like five college kids in this like tiny room with cubes. They'd have their scripts, stuff like this. And then I give them a spreadsheet, like a list like, that I printed out and they just smile and dial in. And then once we figured out that that would work, I, uh, we scaled it to like 15 to 20 reps. I had an outbound call center that I hired a call center manager. And then, and so this is like, brings us up to like 2014 was when I left that company. I was like, you know, I want to help other companies do this. And that's how we sort of got into blissful prospecting was I was doing a lot of consulting, but I was like, you know what? I really love working with salespeople, sales teams, uh, prospecting is like the hardest thing to do as a sales professional. So how can I make this a more blissful <laughs> experience um, for folks by giving them a good process that they feel like really good about, you know, and that are confident that we'll work to get meetings with folks. Yeah, that's great. So, so it's funny, you know, I fell into sales by accident. I think almost everybody does, you know, yep. nobody goes to college and says, you know, I want to grow up and be a salesperson when I graduate. That, that sounds like a good thing. And so you're going to be NCIS and instead you wind up with this love of sales. What is it that you like about teaching and coaching so much? Uh, what I like is, I mean, I like doing things myself, but it just, I don't know what it is, man. Uh, I don't know if it's because I saw my dad, my dad coached a lot of the sports teams and I saw how involved he was and how much fulfillment he got out of helping other people. But I always just like enjoyed helping someone else accomplish something. Um, I like, to be honest with you, I'm not super comfortable being in the spotlight. It's just something like growing up, I was always very shy and we were kind of taught to be kind of more on the humble side. 
So I always like like helping other people achieve things. That gives me a big high when someone's like, dude, I landed a meeting using like the stuff that we talked about, Jason. Like to me, that's like so much better than landing a big client for us. Um, I love that. Um, I love when someone's having trouble with something because no one's really ever taken the time to give them a framework and like a process around it. I love kind of being able to come in and be like, you know what? Like, here's something you can wrap your head around and make your own. Like that to me, that just feels so good. Um, so I don't know. I don't know if that's a good answer to your question or not, but it just, it feels really, really good to me to help other people. Yeah, I actually think it's a great answer. You know, I, I'm a sales coach and trainer also, uh, although I don't focus just on prospecting, I, I focus on, you know, everything. Uh, but, um, and whenever I say this, I, I always include, I don't say this to be altruistic, but I, it, it is a great feeling when somebody sends you an email or gives you a call or sees you the next time and says, oh my God, I tried that thing that you suggested and it worked and I closed a deal or I got an appointment, yeah. or got a promotion. There is a really great feeling in helping others. And I don't know that everybody's wired up that way, but it, it, tr- it feels good to give. And, and I, I'm the opposite of you. I actually like to be uh, in the spotlight. And for me, standing on a stage and um, watching people's light bulbs go off, because when you're in front of a, a room full of mm-hmm. salespeople and you're training, uh, you can you can see when people are getting it and, and when they're feeling, ah, this is right. And I, I love what you said about, you know, having it feel right to them, because there's so much about prospecting in the past that's been about, here's the exact way you do it. Here's the script that you follow. And, and for so many people, it just feels unnatural and uncomfortable. And, and I, I even love the name of your company. Uh, what, what is bliss, blissful prospecting and how does that differentiate from typical prospecting? Well, so I think there's like three parts to this. Like when we look at prospecting, there's really kind of three activities that we, that we do, right? There's our ability to identify a good fit company and a person. So that's your ideal client profiles, your personas. There's our ability to engage folks. So that's our messaging, our sequences, like getting the conversation started. And there's the convert part. The convert part is how do I like secure a meeting, <laughs> right? How do I take this conversation and actually get a sales process started with them? So there's kind of like an, a really old school way of doing that. And there's more of like a new ish school way. I'm not going to say new because it's not brand new. Like people have been doing this for a while, but I think it's becoming more mainstream to do it this way. So there's three kind of shifts um, that are really important. So on the identify side, it's like, how do we go from mass blast to oh my God, I got this list of a thousand people. I can't wait to just send an email. I'm going to get, it's going to be so awesome to quality first. So how do we find a balance of, instead of focusing on the 3000 people that we could do business with, what if we just started with the 50 that are the best fit and we sent them messages that felt like it was just for them. And we researched them and made sure that they have a good reason for taking a meeting with us. So thinking about them. Uh, The second sort of shift is how do we move from me centric messaging so that engage stage that I talked about to you centric. So you might hear product centric to problem centric. I don't think that you necessarily need to always focus on the problem, but instead of this, uh, hey Jeff, my name's Jason and I work with Blissful Prospecting. We're a top training company for tons of companies in your re-. It's like, no one cares, dude. No one cares about that. They're so desensitized to that. And I think that a lot of even Fortune 500 companies rely on their branding and their reputation too much and that actually kind of hammered some companies with, with COVID, right? Where it's like, I can just say I work with, you know, insert Fortune 100 company and people are just going to take meetings with you. That's, that's not happening right now. So how do we talk more about them? And then the third critical shift is how do we go from this like kind of old school uh, Alec Baldwin, Glenn Gary, Glenn Ross, always be closing uh, mindset to teach, don't take. So instead of saying, hey, Jeff, I want 30 minutes of your time because I want to share with you how we're helping other companies like yours. And I want to talk about our products and our services and all the awards that we've won. um, How can I bring in an element of something that I could teach you? So for me, when I'm prospecting, that's, um, dude, I I would love to share with you like what other like SaaS companies right now are doing uh, to help their reps feel more confident so that they pick up the phone more. I'd love to share with you what three other companies working with that are similar, like what they're doing to solve for that right now. So I can bring some insights to the table as well. And that's our true value, I believe, as a sales professional is I work with hundreds or dozens or thousands, depending on how long you've been selling, of companies exactly like yours. So I get to see all this perspective that you don't get to see because most businesses are very, the people in those businesses are very siloed in that business. So to me, that's that's how we make prospecting more blissful. (laughs) I don't know if prospecting is truly a blissful activity, but that's how we make it more blissful is like, The theme there is how do we focus on them and think about their perspective and what I would want if I was a prospect 
before we talk about what we want, because we have to help people get what they want before we can get what we want. Yeah, uh, uh, there's so much in there to unpack. Uh, I, I say the same thing that, that uh, you know, I, I may not be able to make you love prospecting, but I can certainly get you to hate it less if you actually <laughs> have, have a plan and you know what you're doing. I, I love yeah. the idea uh, of an ideal client profile. Can, can we speak to that just a little bit more? Because I, I think too many salespeople go after everybody. Like I'm in a networking group and I learned the hard way very quickly that for me to say, you know, I work with sales organizations all over the world. So any company that has salespeople is a good lead for me. Well, it's too yeah. for people to wrap their head around. Yeah. So, so, uh, having an ideal client profile, can you just speak to that a little bit more? I think it's cool. Yeah. So there's, there's kind of a, a blend. So when we're doing prospecting and we're reaching out to people, like they're not like, that's not a permission based kind of thing. Like they didn't ask to hear from us. Right. So if we talk about and reach out to someone and say, we can work with anyone like you, anyone that's got a pulse that running a company over a hundred employees, that doesn't feel very specialized. It doesn't really feel like it's for me. So we got to keep in mind, we're already trying to overcome the fact that we're a salesperson. People are kind of like reluctant to talk to salespeople that cold call them or cold email. Like I kind of got to come in knowing that and be a little more specific. So there's a blend of three things that I look at with ideal client profiles. Um, I want to look at like where we've had the most past successes so I'm going to look for case studies, testimonials, where we get the best results. And I want to look for patterns. So I, you could use a tool like LinkedIn Sales Navigator. You could use a tool like Apollo.io is one that I like. But let's just look at like, what are the companies we've had the biggest successes with? Because when I reach out to the new companies, if I can say, hey, these other companies that are similar to you had this problem. Are you having it? That's a lot more powerful than reaching out to a company uh, a software company, let's say, and they go to your website and you've never worked with a software company before, right? That's a little tougher to do. So past successes, I'm looking at companies that are the easiest to sell. So I'm, I'm thinking back and looking at my CRM and thinking like, who had the shortest sales cycle? Like who just really kind of got what it is that we're selling? Who has the largest deal size, right? So that's another pocket that I'm going to look at. And then I'm going to look at like highest priority. So you are, if you're in sales, you might not be able to control the fact that your company prioritizes certain companies. If you're an SDR or BDR and you're just prospecting for an account executive, so if you're just doing appointment setting, they might have priorities that are important to them. And then you might have certain kind of companies that your product or service tends to align with more too. So past success is easiest to sell, highest priority. I'm going to look for the combination of those three things. Use a tool like LinkedIn Sales Navigator or Apollo and then I'm looking for patterns in industry, employee count, who I typically engage with at those companies, uh, what kind of problems they were having. There might be geographical things that I'm looking at, but those tools will kind of tell you like the highlights of what to look for so that you can start with that as a good foundation. Yeah. Uh, and I, I love that you're making it about them and not you. It's the same thing during the sales process, not just prospecting, but when you're speaking yep. to somebody, they don't care about you. They don't care that you've got bills to pay and a family to feed or any of that. What they care about, you know, I'm old school. They care about the whiff and what's in it for me, what's in it for them. Yeah. And I think the other thing that's crucial, and you just, you just mentioned it, um, we have to understand that when we're prospecting, for the most part, we're doing interruptive marketing. They're yeah. not waiting for, I, I, I would pay big money for the list uh, of companies that are desperate for a sales coach, think my company is the only one that does it well and thinks I charge too little. But I haven't found that list yet. They're not sitting at their desk waiting for a call or an email from Jeff Goldberg or Jason Bay. They're doing something else. So we have to really appreciate that people are busy. They've got other stuff on their mind. What they've got on their mind is not us, it's them. And if we don't, uh, if we're not aware of that, we don't uh, tailor our approach to that, then we're gonna be screwed more often than not. Um, one of the things that I believe is in, in prospecting, consistency is the key. Um, what are your thoughts about that? And how often should a person, a salesperson prospect? Yeah, uh, I mean, consistency is absolutely key. Like the thing that I equate prospecting with the most is exercising. Uh, I don't know very many people that, that love exercising. It's usually something that people kind of have to like, they just get it out of the way. They do it first thing in the morning, whatever. So if we look at like uh, consistency, um, that's like the number one thing. Consistent activity is, is that's like the most important part of prospecting, even if you're not prospecting very well. Because if you do it consistently, um, one of the things that you allow to kick in is every human is an extreme, like we're extremely resourceful creatures, right? You don't allow your resourcefulness to kick in unless you're doing something and experiencing challenges and you're immersed in it on a daily basis, right? So the second part to your question, I think, is like, how do we figure out 
What's the ideal activity for me on a weekly basis? How many emails should I be sending calls? Like how much time should I block off for this? Those are all really hard questions to answer for someone specifically, but I can give you some, like a way to think about it. Um, the way I would think is, uh, so first off, if you're doing full cycle sales, that's different than someone that's just appointment setting. If you're appointment setting, you're, you're doing this all day, right? So I'm gonna assume that you're doing full cycle sales and you maybe you even have to manage accounts, right? Your own accounts. So you're kind of doing every part of this. You're prospecting, you're selling and doing account management. What I would think about is like, what are your, like, what do you have the avail availability to do? And I would look at your existing, you actually might be able to help me with this, Jeff. What, what do you think based on what you know about your audience? Are people managing their own accounts because that presents a whole nother variable or do people kind of hand it off to account managers and they're just focusing on the selling? What do you see? And maybe it's a mix. I believe that this audience for the most part is doing both. They're handling everything. Like I know, I, you know, I'm a solopreneur. I'm doing everything. I'm managing accounts. I'm prospecting. I'm doing all that stuff myself. And I think the majority of this audience is doing the same. Got it. Okay. So let's take that in consideration. Uh, that's something I very much relate to as well. Being a business owner is what I'm going to think about is like, what's the revenue mix that I have right now? So if my goal is to sell a million dollars, let's say in a year, we'll round up. That's not my goal personally, just so you know, it's not that high. Um, so if my goal is to sell a million dollars worth of my stuff and I get half of that, I don't know, from repeat business, whatever that breakdown looks like, I know that I need to make up that other half. And then we start looking at it like a math equation. So if I need to sell $500,000 worth of stuff, what does my average deal size look like? Is it, I'm gonna use round numbers. If it's a hundred thousand bucks, I need to sell five deals. So I need to make that happen. What is that a once per quarter, once, you know, a couple times a quarter, one and a half times a quarter, whatever that is. And then I'm gonna break that down even more and look at just some generic, how many people would I need to reach out to in order to do that? Well, I'd probably have to, if you just use, again, general numbers, if I need to land five new companies and I have a closing rate of 10%, let's say on outbound, I need to get 50 sales calls. Yep. And then I'm looking a layer deeper than that. How many prospects would I have to reach out to you to get 50 sales calls? And let's just use 10 again. And this is a good starting place if you're not doing this. Uh, so 50 times 10, that's 500. So I need to reach out to 500 people over the course of a year. So, and then in terms of touches, eight to 12 touches, 10 plus, somewhere around there is what you wanna think about in terms of total times that you reach out to someone. So now let's just use 10 again. So now we have 5,000 touches, like outreach activities that we need to break apart over an entire year. You could break that down per month and then you could start looking at like how long it takes for you to do that stuff. Uh, so that was like a really in-depth, like a lot of math involved with that, but that's like the detail that I find that people don't go to to be like, okay, 5,000, let me just kind of do the math here. 5,000 divided by 12, that's 416 activities per month. Let's call it 400. That means I need to hit 100 activities per week. Well, time block. How long is it going to take for you to write the emails and to make those phone calls? It's probably going to take a couple hours of your day, each day, to hit 100 activities, I would imagine. So that's a 10 hours of your week. Is it on your calendar? Do you know exactly what you're going to be doing during that time? That's a super long-winded answer, man, but that's, that's, that's what I always do with companies is like, dude, if you don't know exactly what the activity is that's required and you don't block it off in your account, it's not going to get done. A hundred percent. Yeah. Uh, it, I, I think you just gave a long answer for something that I, I completely agree with that people need to track their own activity and see what results they're getting from it because only then can you figure out how much you really have to do, how successful you're being. And the only way to improve on it is to get better at what you're doing so you can shorten each activity. But I mean, you know, 20 activities a day, it, it does really depend on how fast you are typing emails, how many calls can you make. The truth is 20 calls, you can do that in an hour. Yeah, uh, depending on how long your conversations are. Uh, so an hour to two a day could be could be real. The, the trick is so many people hate it so badly that they'll do anything they possibly can to avoid making those calls. And now it's much harder to do 100 calls on Friday than it is to do 20 a day. I, I personally believe a little bit each day, just like you do with exercise, a little bit each day makes it much easier in that consistency puts you into a habit rather than, oh no, it's Friday. I got to make a hundred calls. It's why I don't like call blitzes. How, how do you feel about those? I mean, I do like call blitzes, but I, I don't call them that. I call like a power hour. You know, I don't think like, like if you're saying call blitz, like, oh, once a week we get the team together and we make a blitz. Like, I don't like that. I, it's like, dude, uh, 
you need to be doing this on a daily basis so it becomes a habit. Just do an hour at a time. You don't need to block off three hours in a row to make cold calls, like sprint for an hour at a time. Um, I think time blocking is very important. So it's like, can we talk about call reluctance actually, like where that comes from? Because I think this, because you said, hey, hey, people hate picking up the phone and like doing that. Well, let's kind of think about like why people might be reluctant, you know, to do something. And I think there's a couple of things associated with that. And since we are, you know, people are very emotional as like the old adage goes, people buy based off emotion and justify with logic. Um, well, it turns out the science behind that, that's mostly true, <laughs> right? Like Dan Airely wrote a book called Predictably Irrational. That's the one thing that we can count on people doing is being predictably irrational, right? So I think if you kind of look at the emotional aspects to how people feel about what they're doing, I think a couple things come to mind, right? If my goal when I'm cold calling is to set a meeting, I'm putting an intense amount, I'm putting a ton of pressure on myself. If I go into the call blitz and I say, my goal is every time I talk to someone, I need to get a meeting versus, well, what do I need to get a meeting? I actually need to start a conversation first. So if I'm trying to make working out a habit, instead of like, oh, I need to go work out. No, I just need to go to the gym, make going to the gym a habit, you know? So with this, make starting conversations a habit. So when I go into this cold call, I'm not thinking I need something from Jeff. If I go in needing something, that's what people in our industry refer to as commission breath, right? It's like I'd sense this person needs something from me. They're selling something versus curiosity. Um, I wonder if Jeff at his company might have something that they're having problems with that they might need my help with. I wonder, I, I'm curious. Then the tone completely changes too. I was just making cold calls uh, this morning. It was interesting. I was on a Zoom coaching call, a couple dozen reps at a company we're working with, and they're just kind of call reluctant. So I was like, this today, I'm going to make cold calls for an hour with you guys and, and like prospect to your prospects. <laughs> and it was pretty nerve wracking for me, man. I'm not going to lie, but it was really fun. I always like doing this. And the tone and everything is what people comment. And I'm like, I don't think about the tone. I just think about my goal. My goal is, uh, hey, Jeff, you know, Jason with Blissful Prospecting here. I know I'm probably catching you in the middle of something, but is, is it cool if I tell you why I'm calling here real quick and you can let me know if you want to keep chatting? So you can kind of do like upfront contract or like Sandler calls it or permission-based opening, I call it, because there's so many variations of that that you can do. And it's like, hey, I, I was on your website and I noticed this thing. And typically when I talk to folks like yourself, they're you know sometimes having this problem or they want to accomplish this thing. And for whatever reason, this is getting in the way. Uh, is it cool if I ask you a couple of questions just to see if this would even be relevant for you? And every time I did that, oh yeah, what's up? What do you want to know? You know, it's just like, you're kind of coming in your tone versus, uh, hey Jeff, J Jason with Bullsville Prospecting. Uh, my company does A, B, C, D. And um, I would love to get 30 minutes on your calendar later this week. What does your calendar look like tomorrow? Objection, uh, hang up, right? It's going to be really tough if that's the way that you approach it. So I think the mindset around what am I trying to accomplish? I'm just trying to start conversations. And what do I need to do? I need to do that in a way that makes it about them. I need to have some sort of research that I did. I need to talk about them. I need to talk about problems that people like them have or companies like theirs have. And then I really need to ask questions around that. I don't need to talk about my product and service a ton. That's not the time and place for that. So mm -hmm. I think those two things, if you wrap your head around that and you have a process of how you introduce a call, you know what questions you're going to ask, you know how you're going to close it. Like I typically find that makes people less reluctant when there's you know, the personal training analogy. If I know that my goal is just to go to the gym and I have a workout plan that's prepared and I know exactly what I'm going to do when I get there, like that's going to make it easier for you to go work out and do the thing that you don't really want to do. If you remove all the barriers that could be up standing in the way of you doing that. Brilliant. Uh, it, I, I think the call reluctance always comes down to fear of rejection. I, I'm, yeah. I'm going to ask somebody for something that I want that they probably don't want, and, and they're going to tell me no. And, and that's where you have to be able to slam them with objections, rebuttals, objections, rebuttals, and go back and forth. And, you know, I, I can, in, in listening to you, and I'm so glad we're doing this because I can even hear my old school thinking of, hey, I'm Jeff Goldberg with Jeff Goldberg and Associates. Uh, we're a sales training and coaching firm. We work with companies just like yours, help them get measurable and sustainable sales increases. That's a great script, but it's, it's pounding them in the face. Uh, your, your approach is so much gentler. E even that gentle open, I'm not even sure it, it really is the Sandler thing. You know, I'm, uh, can, I, can I tell you what I'm calling about? And you, know, you can tell me whether you want to continue. I think it's brilliant. And, and really 
uh, instead of putting somebody's back up against the wall who we did interrupt, it kind of gets them to either open up or tell you no. Do, do you get rejected to, with that a lot? Or is it, yeah, I mean, sure, I'll give you another 30 seconds. I mean, I would say eight out of 10 times people are like, okay, cool. And they kind of chuckle a little bit. Um, I, I just like, you can do, you can have so many different variations of that permission base, which is like, I kind of feel like Sandler kind of took like this and it's like very serious, you know? Um, dude, you can have some fun with it. Like, uh, hey Jeff, dude, I know I'm calling you on a Friday afternoon here and you probably got a ton of stuff planned for the weekend. So I'll make this quick. Can I get like, you know, a, a, you know, a couple seconds or whatever, you know, to tell you why I'm calling, you can let me know if you want to keep chatting. And um, I, I think like you can just have fun with it and be more in the moment uh, with what you're doing and really connect with them. This fear of rejection, I think what you got to wrap your head around is like rejection's never going to feel good. Like it's never going to feel good when someone says, no, I'm not interested, dude. Like, I don't want what you, like that's not going to ever feel good. The goal is not to make it feel good. Uh, the goal is to understand that people fear rejection. And because we, need approval from other people or feel like we need approval, it makes us approval seekers. So I don't know why, but people have this uh, inherent desire to get other people's approval that don't know them and that they don't know. Like, I don't want to walk in a grocery store and have people give me a funny look and like make me feel like I'm not supposed to be, that doesn't feel good for me. Even though I don't know who they are, it makes me feel unwelcome. So it's like, just know that that's human nature and what that's going to do is make you seek approval from people that you don't know. Um, you don't need the prospect's approval. You don't need them to like you. That's not what this is about. Like, they don't need to like you. And you're not con in control of their feelings. And they don't control your feelings. So if someone's rude to you, don't take it personally because it's not because of what you did. Obviously, they have other shit going on in their life. <laughs> if they answer the phone and they're super grouchy, right? That's not on you. You did not cause that. You're not responsible for other people's feelings. So if you can kind of wrap your head around that and be like, you know what, I don't need this person's approval. I really just want to start a conversation with them and see if they're even open to the idea of me telling them why I called. And then I'm going to be, are you open to the idea of me talking about problems that we help other people like you solve? And if not, that's okay if they're not. It's totally okay if they're not. Well, look, eight out of 10 is a great number. And for years, I taught that, you know, bang them in the head uh, methodology. But I think the thing that first attracted me to you is I saw you on LinkedIn and uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but I think it was uh, you were kind of sampling a script and it was, you know, can I tell you, can, can you give me 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling? And after that, you can decide whether you want to continue the conversation or not. I went, holy crap, it's so gentle. And it, the, the fact is, and I, let me back up for a second. I used to teach salespeople up until probably six or seven years ago. You've got to control the sales process and everything about it from start to finish. And about five or six or maybe seven years ago, I had a revelation that we can we control almost nothing. The prospect yeah. can answer the phone or the email or not. They can give us the appointment or not. They can buy from us or not. There's very yeah. little we can do about that other than conduct ourselves yeah. in a way that gets them to want to do business with us, to uh -huh. want to meet with us. And when I, when I saw that approach of yours, am I right? Can I get 30 seconds to tell you why I'm calling and you can decide whether you want to chat further or not? Was that you? Yep. I think, so. yeah, I, I was like, oh man, I can't believe how beautiful that, that is. So, so, um, I think, what do you call permission-based uh, uh, process? Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, per permission-based. Uh, so you hit on, so this is something I call the five desires. And one of them, I was just open it up to just kind of review it real quick, is uh, people have a desire for autonomy. Chris Voss talks about this a lot in Never Split the Difference. Great book. But essentially, Chris Voss, all he's talking about is like behavioral therapy and like what a therapist, what I have experienced going through therapy myself like all he did is he took that and he applied it to negotiation and to selling. And basically people have a inherent desire for their autonomy. Like think about when someone tells you, like if I said, Jeff, like um, I want you to come on our podcast, but you have to do this. You're going to be like, dude, <laughs> you're telling me I have to, no, <laughs> that's not going to happen. Dude. I mean, you don't know who you're speaking to my son. <laughs> so like when you tell someone to do something and you don't give them a choice in the matter, it brings people back to like this feeling when you're a kid and your parents told you to do something you didn't want to do and you felt like forced to do it. it, it that makes most kids rebel, right? So we have to give them their autonomy. And we, we, we do that by just asking like little bits and pieces, like getting like little bits of opt-in. Hey, is it cool if I ask you a couple of questions? Um, one thing I do at the beginning of sales calls, uh, like if it's the second call in the sales process, I'll ask like, um, hey, so what I'm thinking that we covered today is like, 
We can review what we talked about last time to make sure this is really important to you. Here's what I was planning and covering. Uh, is that cool with you? Is there, any, is there anything else you would add or take away? Anything else you want to particularly see? It's like giving them a choice with everything that they're doing. They can opt into the experience versus feeling like it's being dictated. Who wants to go out and hang out with people and your friends if one friend is dictating the entire experience, where you go, how long you stay there, what kind of food you're going to be? That's not very fun. No screw one wants to participate guy. in that. Yeah. Yeah, screw that guy. What were the other, uh, you said there were five areas, right? Yeah, so the other one is, yeah. So second is the desire to feel understood. So that's empathy. So real empathy is just talking to the other person and how they might be feeling so that they don't feel like they're crazy. So one of the things that we're working on with a client right now, they sell cost reduction consulting. So they come in and basically come in with a CFO and say, uh, hey, like you're getting overcharged on your utilities by hundreds of thousands of dollars and we can help you save money and we'll split the savings with you. Sounds like an easy concept to sell, but it's amazingly difficult because there's so much like emotion involved with a CFO admitting that they have this big problem. Right. So one of the lines that they're using that this works so well that they actually came up with um, is this, hey, and oftentimes what we find is that like the utilities vendors are overcharging in like 92% of the cases. And that's no fault of your own actually, because they make it really hard to go through the fine print and they give you very little time to actually come through this stuff. So you're making it more about them and the fact that the prospect is not alone. Other people are getting taken advantage of by this other third party too. So it's this desire to feel understood. Um, the third one is the desire to be the hero. So we've kind of already talked about this. Like uh, if you look at Batman, like the newest trilogy of Batman's with Christian Bale, like the reason why it's such a fascinating story is Bruce Wayne, the hero of the story, he has this problem, right? Where he wants to fight crime, his parents died and he ends up getting like thrown in jail. And he thinks that I can fight crime from the inside out. And then Liam Neeson and the League of Shadows comes along. So that's the guide. So this is the story brand framework from Donald Miller. So Liam Neeson comes along and says, hey, Batman, there's a smarter way to do this. You need to go up in the hills and become a ninja. Is it basically what Bat Batman is essentially a ninja, which is hilarious. Um, but that hero's journey, Batman is the hero, Bruce Wayne. If I'm prospecting to you, Jeff, like you don't want to be a Liam Neeson, a League of Shadows. You want to be, you're, you're Batman. Like my job is to be the guide and help you with your problem, not to be the hero. And a lot of times the way that we sell is that our product or service like we're, the, we're going to come in and save the day. And I just think that's completely wrong. Uh, Donald Miller from StoryBrand, like that's kind of his framework. He believes that that's completely wrong as well. Um, so prospects want to be the hero. The fourth desire is for novelty. Uh, people just love novel stuff, like unique things that are different from the norm. So that's pattern interruption. So think about what it's like being on the receiving end of that and do something different, right? That permission-based opener is a pattern interruption because most most of the time when you pick up a telemarketing call, that's not what people ask. They don't ask you if you want to participate in the telemarketing call. <laughs> no, it's, right? it's, this is an important call. Don't hang up. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then the last uh, is the desire for insights. Uh, people love knowing what other people like them are doing to solve problems right now. So if I'm reaching out to a VP of sales, that VP of sales wants to know a lot about what other VPs of sales and what other sales teams are doing to crush it and hit their goals. So it's this concept of teach, don't take. I need to have something to share. So those are the five desires that like every human has these desires and we need to incorporate them into how we prospect and sell. Mm, that's great. So um, I, I love that last piece. Um, so are you, uh, this is kind of, this question is kind of in regards to that. Are, are you a fan of making as many calls as you possibly can or making less calls and doing a lot of research first? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a balance between the two. Um, I think it has to do with what you're selling too. So if you're selling something pretty transactional, that's like under $10,000, like you probably don't have to do a ton of research compared to I'm selling stuff that costs six figures. That's where I might spend a whole hour researching a company before I even write an email. <laughs> you know what I mean? Cause there might be five people that I need to reach out to. So I think quality, like we have to define what that means for you. And I think you look at deal size is one of the things you can look at sales cycle and how long or short that might be. Uh, I'm looking at how many people I have to engage in the company. And I, I, I want to err on with research, finding something that's relevant to them, something that's specific, and then also something that's repeatable for me to do. So it has to meet all three of those criteria. And I think you need to kind of find the balance of what that looks like. So if you're selling something that's very transactional, that might be I spend two minutes looking at their website real quick and then I fire something off. 
versus something that's more six figure range. I might spend an hour and then there's everywhere in between. So I would think about how can I find the three to five things that are going to be the exact same for every kind of company I reach out to like theirs. I know that every SaaS company is going to potentially be hiring new sales reps. That's something I could mention. Uh, I know that they're going to have uh, indicators of growth um, somewhere on their site or new clients that they're working with or something. Like I know there's things that I can find on the VP of sales LinkedIn profile that would indicate they care about this kind of thing. And those are going to be the three same patterns I look for in every VP of sales I prospect to. So it's really more about the repeatability of that and having stuff that you're looking for, but the same stuff that you're looking for every time you reach out to someone like that. No, that so I don't have an exact answer for you there, but that's kind of how I think about it. No, that makes perfect sense. And you know, today we have such an amazing availability of information that we can get fairly quickly that yep. there's almost no excuse, unless you are, like you said, in the low, low dollar volume, high transactional sale. Uh, there's no excuse for not doing some research. One of my coaching clients reached out to me just the other day and he had targeted somebody specific. He knew this was a great company for him, really wanted to get in, found the, the name of the right guy, connected with him on LinkedIn. He said, Jeff, I don't know what to do next. And I jumped on uh, the LinkedIn profile and within like two minutes, I was able to find several things that the guy yeah. could easily talk. One, one was the guy, the prospect was interested in Gary V, you know, because you know, you see who he's following. Just turns out that my coaching client loves Gary V. I said, well, here's something you can absolutely talk about. Yeah. He, uh, Send him he, one of Gary Vee's posts and ask for his opinion on it, you know? Yeah. Uh, he, he went to the University of Hartford, which means he's not a complete moron. But the important thing was he was in a fraternity there. And I, I went to the fraternity website and found out that one of their main tenets is mutual beneficial arrangements. Well, yeah, my client also believes in that. I said, wow, you should talk about that. I mean, it's so easy to find some stuff if you just invest a little bit of time. Now, you, you've talked about both email and phone. Is there one or the other that you use more than the other? Is one being more effective these days? Do you use them together? And if you yeah. do, what comes first? Does the cold call come first or the email? How does that work? Yeah, so what you're kind of getting at here is like the sequence, like what is the uh, ideal contact strategy, right? So there's a couple different parts to sequences and I'll give you kind of the guidelines for it and then you gotta kind of have to play around with it because uh, it's totally industry uh, dependent. It's also totally what your strengths and weaknesses are. Um, I personally love the phone. Um, I love the phone because it's faster. I can get feedback really fast and I can get feedback on value props. I can get feedback on, did I hit the right challenge problem? And that helps my emails too. A lot of people are not great at writing emails. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't work on it, but you kind of go with what you, what you're good at, you know? So with an outreach strategy for cold outbound, you want to be thinking about a couple things. And so sales loft, outreach, vanilla soft, all these sales engagement tools that are essentially a CRM for outbound activity will all kind of generically tell you the same. It needs to be between 10 and 12 touches. So between phone, email, social, whatever, 10 to 12 touches over the course of 30 to 45 days. They need to be two to seven days split apart between them. And then you need two to three channels. So I always recommend at least phone and email. And then you can add the social component. But you know what? I was just talking to a client yesterday where they get all of their meetings through social, through Twitter and LinkedIn. And then no one responds to their emails or picks up the phone. So that works for them. You know what I mean? Uh, but most people, I would say email and phone. So we think about a sequence, a really good, easy way to start if you're not really doing this is um, I like to use a technique called triple touch, or you can call it triple threat is what another person I heard call it. Combo prospecting is what Tony Hughes calls it. Uh, but it's this concept of week one, let's say on a Tuesday, I'm going to go to Jeff's LinkedIn profile I'm going to then pick up the phone and call him. If I don't get him, I'm going to leave a voicemail. I'm going to leave the voicemail. And then it's going to say at the end, hey, Jeff, uh, I'm going to send you an email right now. And the subject line is going to be, hey, Jeff, just left a voicemail. And then I fire off the email. So I got three touches, three, four touches that are all, in one, uh, all at once. Right? I have phone, email, and then LinkedIn. And then on Thursday, I'm going to send a short follow-up on the same email chain that says, any thoughts? That's it. Any thoughts, Jeff? Short, sweet follow-up. And that so message- You didn't reply, right? Yeah. That, that message is going to focus on, between those two messages, uh, you're going to focus on the biggest problem that they might be having. That's the content of that message. And then next week, I'm going to do the same thing. Tuesday, triple touch. Thursday, short email follow-up. And then what I can also throw is I can also throw in more phone calls if, if I want to. 
Um, but the first three weeks are going to look exactly like that. That's a really great way to just kind of start and see what works and what doesn't. So if you do that, that's uh, what that's, if you do it in three weeks, that's three phone touches and six emails and three LinkedIn touches, right? In three weeks. And then I adjust as necessary with that. So another thing that I do is if you're using a tool, you can create a trigger to where when someone opens up an email twice, I call them, you know? So you kind of have like a way to follow the engagement is what I call that. Um, so that's kind of, uh, and I forgot your exact question, but that's kind of how I think about the contact strategy and like the sequence, like that's just a really great place to start. And then from there you can tweak as, uh, as needed. Got it. And, and let, if you were starting with an email, would you say pretty much the same thing that you would say if you got somebody on the phone or is that a different message? Oh yeah. That was the other part of your question is what to send first. I like picking up the phone first, but some people like to send a couple of emails. Um, I haven't necessarily seen one work better over the other. So I don't know. I think you do test those for your situation to see what works better. But in terms of the message uh, we have like the reply method and the framework for that is like the R is for relevant results. E is for empathy. So talking about the problems or the aspirations and P is personalization. Then the first three parts of the reply method are what your message looks like. Hey, Jeff, personalization, empathy, relevant results, call to action, cold call. Hey, Jeff, I do my opener, ask for permission. Yeah, you got 30 seconds, Jason, go ahead. Hey, the reason I'm calling is personalization, empathy, relevant results. Is it cool if I ask you a couple of questions to see if that might apply to you? So the, so the uh, reply method really gives you a good structure and a framework for that message where I'm talking about stuff that's relevant in terms of results that they care about. I'm empathizing with them. It's personalized. It's laser focus. That's the L. So laser focus is emails got to be less than five sentences or less than 120 words. Uh, my cold call opener, it's got to be like 10 seconds. I get to the point quick, right? Voicemails under 30 seconds. And then the Y is for you oriented. So that's the make the prospect the hero part. Make it about them instead of talking about I and we. So the messaging framework when you're doing the sequence, like that email is going to have the same content that you left in the voicemail. It's just going to have subtle nuance because it's a voicemail, right? And obviously I'm not an email. My cold call is going to talk about that same message that I left in the email. Like there's a reason why like marketing that you see ads multiple times, why it's so effective. You're saying you're seeing the same message multiple times. You don't see a Nike ad and be like, that's weird. Why would they send that? Why would I see that? I saw that ad yesterday. No, it just like slowly kind of starts to build this uh, minor uh, Bader Meinhof, I think is the effect. Bader Meinhof is, yeah, when you see you're going shopping for a car and then you see that car everywhere all of a sudden, right? You can create that same kind of effect with your sequences. So don't be afraid to use the same message and repurpose into, you know, audio over the phone, into video, maybe if you send it or, uh, you know, your email. And, and so let's say you, you're the type of person that uh, does like to pick up the phone and you don't get the person. I'm assuming you're suggesting somebody does leave a voicemail, yes? Yep. And what would you say in a voicemail? Because that seems to be the biggest challenge, getting through to people. Most of the time you're gonna get a voicemail initially. When you get somebody uh, and you get their voicemail, how do you get them to call you back? Well, I think if we look at the purpose of the voicemail as not as a way to get the person to call me back necessarily, but let's treat the voicemail as like a bump notification. Because you know what? I call BS on anyone that says, oh, I get 80% of my voicemails returned. Okay, dude, show me. I want to see that. Record yourself doing this stuff and, and like, show me. The voicemails, I was just talking to someone else on a podcast about this. It's like, it's kind of always been a less than 5% of people call me back anyways on a voicemail. And right now it's probably less than 1%. So let's not even like look at the voicemail as a way to get the person to call us back. Let's look at it as a way to get them to look at something else. So I'm going to say, uh, Hey Jeff, and I don't, uh, I'm gonna say the voicemail a lot like how the email would be written. So I'm not gonna introduce myself at the beginning of the voicemail. Uh, hey Jeff, uh, I saw on LinkedIn uh, that you've been a sales leader for 20 years. I, I thought it really stuck out to me that you accomplished this big thing. Um, you know, the reason I'm reaching out is one of the you know, problems that I hear a lot of VPs of sales are really racking their head around figuring out is how do we you know, motivate our team in a virtual environment right now and keep them motivated to pick up the phone. And I'm working with other companies, you know, like yours. And I wanted to share what, you know, some of the things that they're doing right now to keep their teams motivated. Uh, no need to call me back. I'm about to send an email to you right now. It's going to say, hey, Jeff, just left a voicemail. And again, no need to call me back. But if you want to, my number is this. Otherwise, just take a look at the email. I'm going to fire it off to you here in a, in a minute or two. 
This is Jason with Blissful Prospect. See ya. You know, like that kind of thing. Very similar message uh, in terms of structure with the nuance at the end of, let me see if I can point them to something. So it's kind of like the gym analogy again. You're taking the pressure off. It's not like I've got to get you to call me back. It's like, hey, you know what? Call me back if you want to, but here's why I was calling and be on the lookout for this email. Brilliant. Yeah, exactly. Right. I'm, I'm about to shift my entire methodology. <laughs> uh, Ryan, Ryan O'Hara from a company called Lead IQ talks about this with their reps there. He calls it hyping up the email. So I'm about to send you this really good email. There's like three, uh, it's going to link to three really good tips that VPs of sales are using with their sales development managers right now to like get their managers on a weekly call together and like to really motivate them to pick up the phone. I think you'd really like it. So be on the lookout for that. You know, it's like really hyping up is what Ryan calls it. I, I really like that approach. Yeah, that's fantastic. Now, what about social media? Are you using a lot of social media outreach? Do you teach that also? And if so, how do you use that? Yeah, social media is tough, man. I think people, I think people are either anti-social media or they're like over the top social media and they do too much of it. Um, we only focus on LinkedIn because we're focused on B2B and that's where most of the prospects are. It's definitely a part of the strategy. Um, primarily the way that we teach uh, using it is sending a connection request, you know, connecting with someone. And then you can kind of read from there if the person prefers talking. This is why you do multi-channel because the person might prefer to talk to you over LinkedIn. I have a prospect at this company I'm trying to get hold of and he will only talk to me through LinkedIn. He doesn't return any of my calls, opens emails, but doesn't return them, but he's on LinkedIn and, and that's the place where I can message him. So I think the connection request as part of that first triple touch is big. And if you connect with someone, uh, what you can do is, uh, so Kayla Citrin there, I had her on my podcast and she's just crushes it. She gets like 35% response rates using videos on LinkedIn. So what she does is sends a welcome video. Uh, so use Vidyard, BombBomb, yeah. Loom, whatever you want to use. Uh, and you record the screen. So instead of just you, you record the screen with your little uh, picture in the bottom. And I do it on your LinkedIn profile. So the thumbnail that they see is your LinkedIn profile. Uh, hey, Jeff, Jason here. Just want to say I appreciate connecting, man. And um, I talk to a lot of people about like you, and they tell me that they're focused on this right now. What are you focused on? Let me know. I'd love to, love to learn a little bit more. And then that's basically it. So you send that welcome message through video and then see if you can get a chat going. And then from there, there's a whole kind of art to doing that. But that's about the limit of what we do. Like I, I try not to focus too much on like, oh, you should be creating content and like doing all this other stuff. I think that's a little harder to manage for most reps. And I don't know that you necessarily need to be a content creator. Um, it definitely helps if you have a good personal brand. But I, I find that it can be kind of overwhelming to, to start with if you're not really using LinkedIn right now. Yeah. And like anything else, it, it, it's like you see, you got to go with your strengths. You know, some people are just yep. phenomenal at it. Uh, there's a guy on LinkedIn who I, I love, uh, Joe Applebaum, really brilliant at it. And he's constantly putting out content. Yep. Uh, I, I, he was on a Facebook Live with us, I think a month and a half ago. But it, it's not for everybody. I think everybody can use LinkedIn, but that, that whole content creation thing, you've got to be pretty clever and pretty creative and not everybody is. Um, is there anything that salespeople need to be doing for prospecting differently during the pandemic? Uh, yeah, so there's a couple of things like if you haven't done them. I, I think that like the pandemic has uh, made us like need to lean in more to doing things the right way. <laughs> so I don't think it's like changed the way that we are doing things. It's just made empathy more important. Talking about the prospect more important because you know what? Like they cannot afford nice to haves. Businesses are not spending money on nice to haves right now. Right? So I think it's made us lean more into that, but there's one very tactical thing that I would recommend if you haven't done it yet, because, so if we're talking about empathy and knowing what's going on in the prospects world, well, that's changed since COVID. So that part of it, the structure has not changed, but what goes into that structure has changed. And one thing that we did at the very beginning is a friend of mine, Jeff Bajoric, uh, sales trainer, sales coach, good friend, uh, I kind of freaked out when like people were starting to shut down because like our pipeline just like dried up for like six weeks in March, no business deals. Everyone was like, we got to punt this, got to talk later. And he's like, you know what you should do is get your clients on a zoom call together and then see how you can help them solve their problems. And I was like, Oh, interesting. So we got like half a dozen clients on. And instead of me coming on and being like, here's how we can help you. I said, Hey, you guys have never met each other. 
what's going on in your world right now? And how can you guys help? I just facilitated the conversation. And I got so many insights from that. I learned more about what they're thinking, the language they're using, the problems that they're solving. And I got really good insights because they were problem solving with each other. And I don't, I, I'm not in their line of business. You know what I mean? I, I'm not in a computer software company. So I got in their language, like what they're doing. And that becomes an insight that I can share when I'm prospecting. Hey, what I'm hearing you know, from our clients in your space is they're really focused on this right now. And I'd love to share, we did a round table and we got some really good insights. I'd love to share some of the things that we you know, came up with for there that I think would be helpful for you. You know, so that's one very actual thing I think you should be doing more of if you aren't doing it, especially right now with COVID. Yeah, uh, I, I, it's interesting you say bring this up. I, I gave a talk on this just yesterday morning about how your clients are really the best source of business intelligence for you. Oh, yeah. And, and, yep. and one of the best things you can possibly do is ask them, hey, why do you do business with me? What, what is it you like about yep. working with me? Uh, I, I had a client recently. Uh, I worked with them on a consulting training, coaching engagement for over a year and a half period. And I sat down with the VP of sales and the sales managers. And I said, hey, you know, I, 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 tell me tell me what went right. Tell me what went wrong. What could I have done better? What did you like? You know, and I, I, What did you like about doing business with me? And um, I, I've been in, I've had my business 16 years. I've been in sales almost 48 years now. And they said something to me, which I had never, ever thought of before. I mean, in my mind, the only reason people hire me is they want sales to go up. Why would you pay a sales coach or a sales trainer unless you want to increase sales? So that's an obvious one. But one of the things they said to me to a T, everybody in the, in the entire group said, oh, you want to know what we like best? Our salespeople are more confident. Yeah. Your work with them made them more confident. And never once did it occur to me that what I do causes them to be more confident. Now, maybe it was blazingly obvious and right in front of my mind, because obviously if you're confident in sales, you're more likely to close business, but it never occurred to me. And if I hadn't asked my clients, then I would never have thought of that on my own. And like you say, I'm now able to say, hey, you know, one of the things my clients tell me that they like about working with me is their salespeople have more confidence, which leads to more closed business. Uh, so getting them on a phone call like that or a Zoom call like that, I think is brilliant and something we can all still do, COVID or not. Um, uh, we're quickly running out of time. I did want to know, what do you mean by think outside the script? Yeah, those five desires that I shared, that's really what think outside the script is. Think outside the script is bigger than the sales script. It's not like, oh, when I make a cold call, I say these exact same things. It's what is the script that you as a human being fall into when you're selling? So when I cold call, I sit at my chair, I open up my list, I say the same thing every time, I research in the same, like how can you shake things up a bit? And like, you know what? Instead of making calls at this time, I'm gonna make it at this time. Instead of saying this thing where I normally talk about myself a lot, I'm gonna do the exact opposite of that. Um, I'm gonna make them standing up in a different room. You know, it's, it's like, how can you really like shake up the pattern that you're in and think outside of like the script that we can fall into as a human being when we wake up and we just do the same thing when we're selling every day. And those five desires are really kind of how you can get started with that. It's like really tune in into what like other people want and make it about them instead of making it about us and like shake it up a little bit. I was just going to say, it's like shake it up and do something different. Yeah. Maybe, maybe you won't sound like a robot automaton like you probably yeah. do when you're making cold calls. It's interesting you, you said uh, stand up. I don't know if you know this name, but I used to work for Steve Schiffman who uh, wrote the book, Cold Calling Techniques That Really Worked. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I used to work in his organization. That's how I got my start in the sales training business. And, and when I first met Steve, I walked into his office and he had a podium on the side, but, uh, you know, off to the side of the, you know, he had this huge desk and off to the side of his office, he had a podium. And eventually I said, Steve, um, what's the podium about? Uh, do you practice giving public speeches, you know, uh, at your podium? He goes, no. I said, well, I, I've never seen a podium in somebody, you know, normally you see that on a stage. What's it about? He goes, walk over to it. And I, I walk over and there's a telephone on it. And I said, well, <laughs> I have a telephone on a podium because I stand up when I make my calls because sitting at my desk, I think one way and standing up, I not only think differently, but I sound different standing yeah. up. You sound better when you stand. So I, I, I love that. Um, we're just really almost out of time. Any, any one really killer uh, thing that you'd like to leave people with uh, regarding prospecting? Uh, I think it's, you know, don't, yeah, don't prospect to make a sale, prospect to start a conversation. Like, how can I get better at starting conversations? The thing that I would really look at is like, um, I really believe that sales is a lifestyle. How can I find more alignment in what I, and how I act as a uh, person in my personal life with my sales life? And how can we connect 
those two and find alignment versus I put on my sales hat. So those five desires, the desire for autonomy, how can you implement that more in your personal life? How can you give the people in your life, your husband, your wife, your kids or whatever, how can you get more, get them to buy in more by actually giving them a choice, which I know can be really hard sometimes because, you know, most people are control freaks, including myself. It's been something that's been like so hard for me being uh, running a business, but how can you find more alignment in those two? So you don't have to put on your sales hat because you shouldn't be aggressive and selling people in your personal life anyways. Right. So it's like, how can you be more like how you would want to be in your personal life, knowing that you're a human being in sales, talking to another human being? How can we just find more alignment between those two things? So you don't have to put on your sales hat. So how do we have a better conversation? Yeah. All right. We've got three and a half minutes left. And Lizzie just asked a question. And I hope we have time for it because I want to give you time to share your contact information. Lizzie asks, in your messaging, either when you're talking to or emailing a prospect, how do you balance out letting a prospect know that you work with businesses like theirs while still making them feel special and individual? Yeah, I think it's all about the very first two lines of your email, like that personalization snippet. It's, uh, hey, Jeff, saw this thing on your website, saw this thing on LinkedIn. Looks like this is important to you. Looks like you did really great work with that client. And then I'm going to talk about empathy, his problem, right? Uh, or it's not, sorry, not your problem, problems that other folks like you have told me that they're having. And then the relevant results piece, that's when you're going to talk about, hey, you know, we've worked with some of these other companies and here I'd love to share with you how they solve those problems. So I think it's the order that you do it. I'm going to start with you. The first two, three sentences of that email are going to be about you. The first two, three things out of my mouth when I'm cold calling are going to be about you. Because that's what people care about. Exactly. That's going to perk up their ears too. Because that's the other thing is like when you pick up a telemarketing call, and as soon as you realize it's a telemarketing call, you, you kind of tune out, <laughs> right? You want to get the prospect's attention by talking about them at the very beginning. There's actually so many things that make you tune out. For me, one of them is predictive dialers. When I pick up the yeah. phone and go, hi, this is Jeff, and there's that three-second delay, I'm like, are you kidding me? Really? Yeah. Am I inconveniencing you by picking up the phone? Yes, there's so many things that we can do wrong. And, uh, you know, uh, having somebody like you to share information like this is, is brilliant. Lizzie, I hope that was useful for you. Um, can you just tell people quickly, what, what is it that your company does and how, how do you work with, uh, do you work with individuals or only organizations? What is it that you guys do? Yeah. So, so we help sales teams and sales reps uh, who I would say love, you know, landing big meetings with prospects, but hate it uh, either when they, you know, write a cold email, no one responds or hate feeling, you know, really yucky about picking up the phone and calling people. So that, that's really what we help with. It's all about prospecting. How do we do it better? Um, we work with individuals in our boot camps. Um, so we're right in the middle of one right now. We got one coming up here in a couple of weeks. Um, so that's more like, how do you get, you know, kind of group support for me and the course and like all that other stuff. And we also work with companies privately as well. Um, but blissful prospecting, I mean, all the information's there. There's tons of free content. So if you just want the free stuff, we got a podcast, we post on LinkedIn. There's all kinds of goodies in there. So they can follow you on LinkedIn and I'm, bringing up my screen right now. Uh, oh, I don't even see it. So how can people reach you? Uh, do you have an email address where they can get to you, uh, a phone number? Yeah, I would just go to the website, blissfulprospecting.com. That's gonna be the best bet. There's a contact form. If you do wanna contact me and, or LinkedIn, you can direct message me on LinkedIn as well. Um, those are the two best things. Yeah, and I, I, I've, I've been on your uh, website several times, it's great. And I just shared this with the uh, gang yes, uh, yesterday. Uh, I love that you have all kinds of resources for people that are just, here's why I love this app. It's brilliant. And there's a lot of great stuff on there. Yep. Jason, thank you so much for your generous sharing of your brilliance today. I really appreciate it. You are truly a guru. And uh, <laughs> uh, I, I hope everybody watching replays this over and over because there were nugget after nugget in here. Uh, thank you again so very much today. Absolutely, man. I appreciate you having me on. It's my pleasure, Julian. Uh, for the Sales Pro Network, remember that sales is a game of making things happen. Get out there and make sales happen. Bye, Jason. See ya.